We recently celebrated the downloadable content that somehow managed to be even better than the original game. Although in some cases, that wasn't hard. Damn, I'm looking good. No, I'm looking good. It turns out there are plenty of other cases of DLC that surpassed the game it was for, according to you, the outside Xbox audience commenting on YouTube. Here now are seven further great DLCs that were better than the main game. Enjoy this commenter edition and beware of spoilers for the following games. Welcome to the future. The year is 2007. Nuclear war has nearly destroyed our planet. Now, an evil presence seeks to enslave what's left of humanity. And there's only one thing that can stop it. Nobody threatens my planet. By all accounts, Far Cry 3 was pretty good, even if it did feature the least likable cast of characters since Jersey Shore. Hell is that mother To my father's black card, to my black card! Woo! God, I haven't done Sambuca since I was 20 years old! For viewer Easy Kills, however, the original Far Cry 3 was eclipsed by its neon-drenched standalone downloadable expansion, Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon, a game so 80s it should really only be available for the NES. Blood Dragon took the fun, satisfying gameplay of Far Cry 3 with its quick movements, cinematic takedowns, and weighty gunplay, and transposed it onto a game that paid loving homage to 80s action movies. Part man, part machine, but all Cyber Commando. You play as Rex Power Colt, a cyborg commando voiced gamely by Terminator and Alien star Michael Bean, who is clearly having fun with the material, as we can see in this tongue-in-cheek behind-the-scenes footage. Wait, 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 yeah, just, wait, just do it, all right? All right, but it was... At least, I hope it's tongue-in-cheek. It's kind of hard to tell. F***ing hate it. I got one page. I got nine f on it. The best thing about Blood Dragon, though, is how relentlessly balls to the wall and over the top it is for its entire duration, as you destroy garrisons, mow down enemies with miniguns, and tackle the Blood Dragons of the title, all with an 80s action movie quip never far from your lips. School's out for summer. School's out forever. Blood Dragon is brilliantly, deliberately stupid, and all the better for it, and the neon visuals and killer soundtrack are just the icing on the cake of a game that delivers what it promises dumb 80s action, and lots of it. I'm no hero. I'm just your everyday US military Mark IV Cyber Commando. Seriously though, is Michael Bean okay? Can someone check? I'm here for a paycheck and that's, that's about it. Well, you weren't first choice anyway, but um, we couldn't get Kevin Bacon. Duty calls, huh? Even with a hangover? There's still a war on. Unless the Reapers are on shore leave too? The Mass Effect 3 Citadel DLC is the Michael Jordan of adorable fanservice DLC, which is to say, nobody does it better, and you only make yourself look ridiculous by arguing that they do. Yeah, I watched the Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. There are people trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah, I think he's aware of that. As suggested by commenter Genghis John, the Citadel DLC came out in March 2013, one year after the launch of Mass Effect 3. Spread out, boys. Find me What's more, Citadel was the final chapter of DLC released for Mass Effect 3, which was itself the final chapter in the Mass Effect trilogy, which gave this downloadable content a special significance and a special responsibility as the parting shot from the much-loved saga. Mass Effect developer Bioware therefore made the wise decision to set aside seriousness in order to author a warm-hearted, fond farewell to the characters we had grown to love. Joker, you've been busy. I found some folks who actually like being shot at. Permission to come aboard, Shepard. This took the form of some well-deserved shore leave for Commander Shepard aboard the Citadel, the deep space station introduced as an iconic Mass Effect location way back in the first game. Citadel Control, this is SSV Normandy, requesting permission to land. Stand by for clearance, Normandy. Clearance granted. You may begin your approach. Aboard the utopian high-tech Citadel, your shepherd is given his or her very own and ludicrously fancy sci-fi apartment by Admiral Anderson. I want you to have it. Take it off my hands. 
BioWare scores extra fan service points here for fulfilling the wildest, most exotic future fantasy of a millennial, home ownership. So what was it, Shepard, five minutes before someone started shooting at you? On the other hand, we get this cool secret hideout to hang out in, unless the bad guys look in the window. The main plot of this DLC involves taking your squad to flush out and defeat a shady bad guy who, in a mission that verges delightfully on self-parody, turns out to be your own evil clone. Look at you. What makes you so damn special? Why you and not me? The only improvement I can think of is making the evil clone romanceable, but presumably Bioware ran out of time, which is where their job ends and the work of my fanfiction begins. Here, take my hand. And then? And then we kiss. See? Nailed it. The attack of the clone, however, is secondary to the true point of the Citadel DLC, which is to throw a gigantic rager at your space apartment for your pals from the Normandy, where you can enjoy a series of adorable comedy vignettes featuring your beloved crewmates. You okay, James? Yeah, this is trippy. I'm kind of buzzing all over. Given the cataclysmic ending of the main game, the Mass Effect 3 Citadel DLC has to, and does, take place sometime before the end of Mass Effect 3. And given the arguably disappointing and unarguably somber ending of Mass Effect 3 in 2012, the Citadel DLC became a sort of gratifying epilogue, with Shepard pulling off an uplifting redemption following a difficult defeat, much like Pierre Gasly's surprise podium in Brazil after he was unceremoniously dumped from the Red Bull team. Yeah, I also watched the Formula One Netflix documentary. Now I'm a sports writer. While our vault hunting buddies beat the slam a jam out of that Hyperion informant downstairs, I thought we could play a game. Now pick your characters. You got the Mechromancer, the Commando, the Siren. Siren. Dibs. It might be dressed up like a first person shooter, but Borderlands 2 owes a huge debt to role playing games. Almost as big as the debt it owes to My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, which is referenced multiple times in the game. Someone's clearly a big fan. The debt to RPGs, on the other hand, is repaid in full with the Borderlands 2 DLC Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep, suggested by commenter Just Some Guy Without a Mustache, which is a glorious celebration of the most famous RPG of all time, Dungeons and Dragons. Welcome, fine ladies, to your first session of the most coolest game in the world, Bunkers and Badasses! In the world of Borderlands 2, the tabletop role-playing game is renamed Bunkers and Badasses, and you'll actually get to play through a two-hour campaign DM'd by fan-favourite character Tiny Tina. No missing! I want you to blow up the ocean! The DLC can be accessed at any time by fast travelling to a location called Unassuming Docks, at which point you're plunged into a fantasy world of Tina's creation. Like all good game masters, Tina is more than happy to adapt the storyline as she goes. The bad news for you is, she's arguably a little too happy to change it, with the game dramatically altering as you play. It's eternal night, and you hear spooky music, and the whole area kind of smells like butts and dead people. Hey, this area kind of smells like butts and dead people. I haven't seen the weather turn that fast since, well, since the British summertime, actually. It's this narration from Tina, combined with an entire bag of holdings worth of Dungeons and Dragons references, that makes Assault on Dragon Keep such a joy to play. The dragon attacks, and... <laughs> It'll take more Wait, What's more, the characters you come across in Tina's campaign are fantasy versions of characters in the main game. The bad guy you're battling against is the Handsome Sorcerer, who you'll recognise as a direct reference to Handsome Jack, and Roland, a vault hunter from the first game, appears as a knight. You fought well, girl. I'll be honoured as hell to join your quest. In fact, because Roland is killed at the end of Borderlands 2, the DLC is given emotional punch as Tina uses the game of Bunkers and Badasses to come to terms with his death. And Roland showed up, and he was really happy, and everyone lived forever, and it was great the end. Enough! You can't just deny what Jack did to Roland. Can't hear you! I will admit, if you choose to play Dragon Keep before you finish the main game and don't actually know that Roland dies, it's less emotional and more confusing. But look on the bright side. It also ruins the ending of the main game. Goodbye. Regardless, it's DLC well worth playing. Defeat the Handsome Sorcerer in a dramatic final showdown at the top of Dragon Keep, and you'll finally get to discover the identity of the mysterious queen who's been imprisoned in the tower. For who else could possibly bring the light back to the world? Who else but the most beautiful, most glamorous, and most graceful queen in history? But Stallion! Another pony? 2K, if you want to make a My Little Pony game, just talk to Hasbro. We've paid our dues in blood and bullets. 
This is our fight. Our island. Not yours. Fallout 3 was great. Fallout New Vegas was arguably better. Fallout 4 was... Well, I mean, it was better than Fallout 76. That's something, right? All of our coffee is heated to a perfect 200, 100, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You might want to stand back. All right, I'm not saying Fallout 4 was bad, but I did enjoy it considerably less than the two previous games in the series, thanks to a meandering, unfocused plot and a lack of cool and interesting side quests to keep me busy. Luckily, commenter Armed Wombat has a solution in the form of Fallout 4 DLC Far Harbor, which they say is better than Fallout 4 itself. Careful. This could get out of hand real fast. Set on a whole new island, the largest in a Fallout expansion to date, Far Harbor tasks you with finding a teenage runaway who has run off to Far Harbor, Fallout 4's equivalent of Bar Harbor, Maine. The fog can do a number on you. Get you all turned around. Far Harbor, it turns out, is having problems of its own, with thick radioactive fog, angry fishmen, and a three-way tussle for power between the citizens of Far Harbor, Acadia, a tribe of synth refugees building a new home in an abandoned observatory, and the Children of the Atom, a series regular cult of wackos who worship the atomic bombs that caused all this mess in the first place. The people of Far Harbor need only peer out their windows to look upon the face of Atom. Nice guys. Far Harbor really is what Fallout fans were after all along, with a deep, involving story full of difficult choices that actually matter and have consequences that you'll have to live with. Hearing such a thing from you does carry weight. But I must know why. Add to that a bunch of cool, creepy side quests, some excellent loot, and a host of memorable characters, and you've got something that is a lot more fun to play than regular Fallout 4's endless trudging around Boston, stopping every so often to be told a settlement is in trouble. I've heard of another settlement that's in trouble. I'll mark it on your map. Yeah, thanks, Preston. Whoa. It, it, this looks like... A way out of Haram. Crane, we're running out of fantasy. We have to explore every possibility. We've all seen enough zombie movies to know that one, in a zombie apocalypse, you run away from the zombies as fast as you can, and two, when you can't run away, you aim for the head. We applied these lessons during 2015's Dying Light, in which we kept protagonist Kyle Crane alive through just such an apocalypse by parkouring over the rooftops of Haran and using improvised weapons to stove zombies' heads in. <laughs> Crane himself, though, clearly hasn't consumed enough zombie fiction to have learned the most important lesson in zombie apocalypse survival, which is, never mind zombies, it's actually the humans you've got to watch out for. Because when Dying Light DLC The Following suggests Kyle Crane seek help from an insular rustic community of mysterious cultists, he only bloody goes and does it, the idiot. Listen, I'm from Haran, and I've come because I've heard that there are people here who are immune to the virus. This cult, which might hold the cure to zombie infection, is called the Children of the Sun, because of course it is, and of course you're going to have to do a load of errands for them before you get to meet their leader, who is called, of course, the Mother. F wackos, they're in a damn cult, led by some woman they call the Mother. On the much brighter side, at least Crane gets a lovely change of scenery, since this 2016 Dying Light expansion lets him escape the city for the first time into an even bigger map set in the surrounding countryside. As suggested by YouTube commenter ACNABBX1, Dying Light the following was a worthy and substantial slice of downloadable content for the original game, adding not only a wide open new location, but a new customizable off-road buggy to explore it in. And when I say customizable buggy, that's not just with a selection of fun paint jobs, but with exotic extras like an electrical cage, a flamethrower, and a landmine launcher. There yes. we go. Oh, we go. That there worked. Go. Oh man, got some height oh. on that one. Night of the Living Dead would have been a very different movie with one of these. This Dying Light expansion further mixed things up with new emphasis on shooting zombies instead of bashing them to bits. To that end, it added new guns, but also, and more importantly, a powerful new crossbow to muck around with, preferably in co-op. A very different movie. It all made Dying Light the following a chunky, invigorating companion piece to the main game with exciting new toys with which to play. No wonder even we let our guard down around that deeply suspect zombie-proof cult. We've shown you a path and a sign, Mr. Crane. The rest is up to you. Yeah, this seems fine. Park. Final. Where have you been? Functional imaging interfaces and talking to the ASL. 
We got a patient 30 seconds out and we're blind inside his head. I could call into the chamber, ask them to delay. No, I don't need another performance evaluation. Mr. Park here is going to have us up and running before we even know it. Right, Mr. Park? If you're not familiar with Outlast, it's a survival horror game that's so bowel-loosingly terrifying, you can probably find it in your local pharmacy next to the Senecot. <laughs> yep, that'll get things moving. But given that Outlast is a confusing, disorientating horror game where some of the enemies wander around with no trousers on and the chief antagonist is a humanoid cloud of nanites, you'd be forgiven for wanting just a touch more explanation as to what the heckins is going on. No. Commenter Fanficker92 prescribes the DLC called Whistleblower, which offers a bunch of the answers you need, presenting not just a prequel storyline that sets up the events of the original game, but also a plot that overlaps with Outlast's main story and even an additional finale sequence. Come on in here. How are you doing? Whistleblower casts you as Waylon Park, the IT contractor who, after presumably getting tired of asking evil doctors if they've tried switching it off and on again, sent an anonymous email that brought the original game's journalist hero to the Mount Massive Asylum. Somebody's been telling stories outside of class. On the floor! Down! Unfortunately, as Park, you're immediately caught and subjected to some fairly unorthodox medical techniques. What's the matter? Somebody hit you? Here. Let me help. You're not even licking me on the side you hit me, man! As you'll know from the original game, at this point everything kicks off, with the Wall Rider Nanite Swarm set free and all the tortured asylum inmates released. What follows is a further hour and a half of taut survival horror that intertwines with the original's plot and really fleshes out the story. And when we say fleshes out, we mean a substantial amount of flesh. Coming out. If anything, Whistleblower is even more horrifying, intense and disturbing than the original game was, particularly when you come across inmate Eddie Gluskin, who is obsessed with finding a bride, even if that bride is you, the entirely unwilling bloke from IT. Oh, damn it, darling! No, you need to be We could have... Been beautiful. We're never going to complain about changing a toner cartridge again. One more job shouldn't have mattered. I'd killed nobles before. You could float a whaling ship on the highborn blood I've spilled. Another noble steps in to replace the last one. All equally corrupt. Why should an empress be different? Dishonored told the story of Corvo Atano, a royal protector who wasn't very good at his job. No! Get away from her! Corvo! Oh, oh, Dishonored's two pieces of story DLC, however, the Knife of Dunwall and the Brigmore Witches, both have you playing as the other person in that scene, the supernatural assassin Dowd, who, as you just saw, is very good at his job. I knew I'd pay for this one. Maybe I deserve to. While Dishonored is rightly regarded as a masterpiece, many, like commenter Grim Pinata, think that the DLC is where developer Arcane really perfected what Dishonored is. For a start, Dowd is a better protagonist than Corvo. Yeah, I said it. Whoever. I almost had you, Dowd. You could have had an easy death. While not quite a straight-up villain, Dowd's moral flexibility is much more suited to Dishonored's open-ended gameplay, which is a polite way of saying stabbing people in the head. And the Dowd DLCs use some harder, more combat-focused design to encourage you to use Dowd's more lethal abilities, something that I always felt was being actively discouraged when playing as Corvo. Think I can't hear that. The story in these expansions, told across seven varied missions, also helps tie together Dowd and Corvo's stories, starting in the same place where the Empress is murdered and ending in the final confrontation between the two protagonists. I've had enough killing. So my life is in your hands. 
Added to this are the missions themselves, which include such objectives as breaking into a prison to rescue an inmate, infiltrating a ruined manor house, and exploring a slaughterhouse. They're all peak dishonored and feature some of the best level design seen in the entire series. Yeah, I said best, not best looking. Or smelling, I bet. Yikes. Thank you so much for watching this commenter edition about DLCs that were better than the game they were released for. If you'd like to watch another video of this sort, and why wouldn't you? I mean, what's one more going to do? Can't possibly hurt. Uh, there are a couple more on the screen right now, one from us and one from our sister channel, Outside Extra. And if you'd like to be notified every time one of these videos goes live, then you need to find that little bell icon and click on it next to the subscribe button. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.